بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين uh, I think this is the uh, 13th of May uh, 2020 and uh, our subject today is a continuation of a subject that we've been dealing with for quite a few times in Tafsir of Quran. And we want to revisit that, uh, the subject of Yusuf and his brothers. It says they saw him uh, from a distance and before he came near to them, they conspired to kill him. They said to one another, here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we shall say that a wild animal has devoured him. And we shall see what will become of his dream. Uh, this is referring to Yusuf alayhi salam. We're going to go into this a little bit more. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Kala hal alam tum ma fa alam tu bi Yusuf wa akihi it antum jahiluna uh, he said know you how ye dealt with joseph and his brother not knowing what you were doing this is a little commentary The Arabic words, Wahum la yasharuna. They did not understand, or they didn't know what they was doing. In this case, uh, they did not understand, or you didn't know what she was doing. Uh, may be very appropriately mean three things. First, we were comforting Joseph and his brother. We're quite unaware of this, that a revelation was being sent to him. Second, you will let them uh, know of all this evil act of theirs in such circumstances that they can never even imagine. They can imagine you to be. Thirdly, today they are committing an evil act, but they do not know its future consequences. There's another accompanying, this is from, uh, the other was uh, Said Kutub, the other was uh, Balana Mauduri. And this one is uh, this is from another Tafsir Said Kutubia. Bismillah ar La Tarkabuna Tabakan and Tabakin. You shall surely travel from stage to stage. That you shall certainly ride stage after stage. That is to say, you will pass from one stage of suffering to another, to what has been predestined for you. The Quran used the term ride to denote 
the ongoing of various stages of suffering. Pride is frequently used in Arabic to signify the passage through risk and difficulty. This uses, uh, this usage, usage suggests that difficulties and risk are like horses or mules to be ridden. Each one will take the riders, the stage predestined for it and for them. Thus each one will deliver them to a new stage, which is again predetermined in the same way as universal stages. We're here with Yusuf again, and uh, Yusuf and his brothers. As I said uh, before, I like the story of Yusuf because you can stay on it for a long time. But we're on it for a particular reason, especially today. We said that this story has a happy ending. And it's hard to leave happy endings where most of the world don't have uh, happy endings. Even, you know, in the scriptural world, you see uh, that uh, truth tellers, prophets, messengers, all these good people came to people time after time and they just looked up and they, sometimes they just put cloth over their head. They just did the um yum sum yum book boom thing, deaf, dumb, and blind. I mean, and so, and they don't hardly pay no attention. This is like, you know what we say about the time we're in now? We say this is scripturalism on steroids. And I'll get into a few. This time, I mean today, is scripturalism on steroids. And uh, today we'll also get to the points we've been working toward for quite some time. If you remember, we said in several lectures before, and we wrote it down, uh, that uh, we wrote a good part in history for ourselves, but we wrote a good part in history for other people too. That's been around. We wrote a good part in there for them. And that's what we're going to talk about today, the combination of all the parts. Remember, this La Tatraba, when uh, uh, Yusuf said to his brothers, hey man, it ain't, uh, it ain't nothing, this is all right. Uh, you know, no reproach this day. And then they got to, oh, we did this. Don't worry about that. that that's all, uh, you know, Allah is going to forgive you. Allah is going to give you uh, mercy. He knows where you was coming from. And you did what you did. And you didn't know what you was doing. No way. You know, uh, about shaitan. I wanted to get to this a little later, but I, I'll get to it now. Remember, shaitan... Uh, let's see what uh, what Iblis says. Iblis said, My Lord, give me then respite till the day the dead are raised. Here's what Shaitan is saying. Kala Rabbi Faandirni ila yaumin yabathuna the day they are raised. This is the bliss saying, Kala Rabbi. The shaitan is not talking crazy like uh, he's saying, my Lord. This is what, you got to see what it is. See, a lot of people pass that. They give shaitan, they, oh man, they go running around that he, he do this, he do that. And Allah tell you, and he tells you himself. Just to regress a minute. 
And the devil will say when the matter is decided, surely Allah promised you a promise of truth. I promised you, but I lied to you. I had no authority over you except that I called you and you obeyed me. So blame me not, but blame yourself. I cannot come to your help, nor can you come to mine. I deny your act of associating me with Allah. The, the Quran uses that, that mushrik and all of that. I deny, the devil going to say when it's all over, you can see him now. He's a double cross and snitch. Boy, he just, just look at it. You listen to me? Why well, I denied. I, I lied to you. The, the book, you got a book. What does the book say? It books say I am deceptive. I am a liar. I'm going to come to you with everything you can in front of you, behind you, on all the sides. You know? And then I told you that, uh, that I I'm not going to bow down to you. I bow down to Allah. Because he says, Rabbi, right? I'm rejecting you and your... Uh, and you here made out of whatever it is, clay. And I'm made out of fire. No, 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 no. You listen to me? Oh, my goodness. You committed shirk. Because that's what the Quran said to you. You committed shirk. You associated me with Allah. Oh, man. Good God of my. What are we going to do now? The shaitan, you can hear him acting the fool. Here he goes, says, Kala Rabbi. This is in the 39th of the first, the 37th and the 39th. He's constantly saying, Rabbi, my Lord. So therefore, now, you have to remember, the shaitan, iblis, all that crew, you know, uh, they all run together and they all support each other. Now, the Quran says that, that you had been led astray by shaitan. Basically, it just say, you listen to shaitan and you didn't know what you were doing. They did not understand. Wahum Yasharuna. They didn't understand. They didn't understand what they're doing. Okay. The Quran also is very clear. I only created men and jinn that they serve me. So, in this case, in this rendition, the only one that's aware of what's going on is Yusuf. Right? From the very beginning. Uh, let me find it here. And from the very beginning, he's got a clear message. Well, we can remember that Allah uh, taught him, Thus will thy Lord choose thee and teach thee the interpretation of stories and events. And perfect and perfect his favor to mm -hmm. thee and to thy posterity of Jacob, and to the posterity of Jacob, even as he perfected it to thy fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and aforetime. For thy Lord is full of knowledge and wisdom. So, Rabbuka. Uh, to you. Min Tahwil al Hadith. Yeah. That is, uh, thus thy Lord chose thee and teach thee interpretation of stories and events. That means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has selected Yusuf specifically for a mission. And Allah tells him the mission from Jump Street. 
then his father, he tells his father, and his father say, don't tell your brothers, boy, because that crew, they're already acting funny with you and your brother. So uh, just keep it to yourself. Of course, he just blurted it out. Why? Because there's a whole narration going on. And this narration is arranged by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And everybody in this narration is going to play a part. They don't have to know what part they're playing. But they will play their part. So it goes on to say uh, that... Uh, I but fulfilled toward you the duties of my Lord's mission. Sincere is my advice to you. And I know from Allah something that you know not. Do you wonder that there had come to you a message from your Lord through a man of your own people to warn you so that you may fear Allah and happily receive mercy. This is one of the prophets here. Well, first they say, Ah, see, thou art an imbecile, and we think thou art a liar. <laughs> so he said, O oh, my people, I am no imbecile, but I am a messenger from the Lord and cherisher of the worlds. I but fulfilled toward you the duties of my Lord's mission. I am to you a sincere and trustworthy advisor. Now, Shaitan say the same thing. I did it. I'm new to, oh boy, you can, you can count on me. Do you wonder that there had come to you a message from your Lord through a man of your own people to warn you, call in remembrance that he made you inheritors after the people of Noah and he gave you stature tall among nations. The stature tall among nations is the key to what we're talking about today. It's about the Negro. And it's, like I said, this is scripture on steroids. That's what it is. If everybody had been reading even a section, they've went through all of this over and over again, and it's so repetitive, it's unbelievable. That the people always said, man, you just like us. You can't, you, you speaking the same language, talking the same talk. And then you want us to do something else. You want us to leave what we've been worshiping and come to something else. The Negro in America has been worshiping the white man. Oh, because the white man has authority. Uh, the white man has, a, it's almost like the way Nimrod used to talk. The white man, as far as the Negro is looking, has authority and power to dispense Rewards and punishment. He has, that's, that's what he do. And everybody can see that. And then he dazzled the people with all the little stuff he got. And they go for it. And then remember the people, this is what we want everybody to understand. You, the people we're talking to, are human beings. And according to scripture, you're going to act like a human being, except a very, very minute percentage. Just think of the percentage. That, uh, you know the idea. Uh, you get a chance to look in uh, paradise, and you say, oh, man, everybody going to be there. Then they show you what's around there. Why then they say, I don't think nobody gonna make that, right? Right. So then they show you the hellfire. Then 
You look over in there, you say, oh, man, ain't nobody going to go there. Then they show you what's surrounding that. The hellfire. So, uh, <laughs> good God, I know ain't nobody hardly going to, with all the stuff surrounding it. Both paradise, right? And the hellfire. So the way it's talking is everybody going over here. Because what's surrounding it. What they're being, what they're seeing and tasting and touching. The most of the people are going there. Unless Allah forgive them. And Allah is a Rahman, a Rahim. He's also al Ghafur Rahim. So everybody have hope. But when you look. It was surrounding the people. Oh my goodness. Now there's a few things we want to keep in mind. A lot of this is personal because we talked about years ago not wanting to be in heaven all by ourselves. That's where East Oakland Enterprises came in. That we said, hey, it was really strange because imagine one year in 65 to 66, you looking at all them big pretty cars and it was a, when we would go over to San Francisco and we'd see all them pretty Cadillacs going up and down Fillmore. That's in Fillmore, it's a black neighborhood, of course, because we'd go to the temple over there because Oakland's temple wasn't no good. So we'd go over there. Now I'd take Carlo, the brothers, sometime just a couple of us. They'd be smoking weed all over. Now I was getting contact, I didn't smoke weed, but I know from what I, I was contact all the way over and all the way back. But anyway, it, it was a good lecture for them, 65, 66, it was, it was nice. In fact, Bernard Kushmer was a minister over there. Y'all probably ain't heard. Bernard Kushmer, our Savior has arrived. This is the one by Elijah Muhammad. Yeah. And uh, anyway, so he brought him to Phoenix with him because the lamb moved to Phoenix because he had to, to get out of that cold weather. Anyway, heaven and hell alone. Imagine within one or two years. Now, my partner's They don't know what they're doing. This whole scenario is arranged by Shaitan and his servants. His servants. I'm telling you from back in the early 60s when I went to Pine Grove Forestry Camp and I was up there in the trees, I actually liked it, you know, fighting forest fires and you know what I mean, uh, just out in the woods and the, all that stuff. Then I got sent down from camp to PSI, Preston School of Industry. I was just maybe 18 or something. And I didn't deserve to get sent down the hill, as they used to call it. Then when I was at Preston, I got a lot of stuff happened. I got sent to Tracy, dual vocational institution. This is now medium security prison. I was 18 or 19, something like that. I didn't deserve none of that, but I got sent anyway. When I was getting ready to get out, my date was 1963. We had a ride in the field house in maybe January, February, something like that. I was supposed to go home the next month. In 64, mm -mm. I, like a fool, Jumped up on the, you know, the field house. They got a movie screen in there. They got bleachers. They got all basketball courts. Well, a field house, you know. It's an outside gym, like a big, uh, the whole thing is there. Field house, recreation, weights, all that stuff. Because they might have a fog line, right? Or it's really raining real hard. And you could be still locked up. And you could go and have a good time, you know, in the field house. So it was inside. All the gates, you know, when they locked up the gates, you couldn't go outside. Okay, anyway. 
In fact, uh, Brother Farouk, he told my son, uh, he said, yeah, I got uh, uh, the paperwork. This is a guy that done a lot of time in prison, and he did 30 years, then he went back. You may not believe it. Brother Farouk stayed out a couple of years, and he went back for murder. In 1980, let's say, 84, 85. He got out in 81, 82. Yeah. He'd been in prison all that time. That means his whole life has been in prison. So he has uh, the paperwork from 1964. Yeah, because, you know, you can order your paperwork. From, see, we all got put in a hole. It was a whole group of us got put in the hole. And he was one of them that got put in the hole. And I was one that got put in the hole and has my name, C. Reams, because my son told me, because he, he was in the pen with Brother Farouk. He, well, he knew Brother Farouk. We'd visit him in the county jail. I used to take my sons when I'd visit people in the county jail or visit people in prison, I would take them with me. And they would look at the guy, one of my best friends, who was up on the island together. He from San, we went over to San Francisco County Jail. He said, Dad, he looked tired. I said, yeah. He just got out of the penitentiary. He stayed out a little while. And now he's facing 18 years in prison. That was then, in, in the early 80s. He got out and went right back. He just got out. He got out uh, either last year on that old folk stuff, you know, that uh, you, you're old and the, so they say let him out. Anyway, let me continue. So when I got to Tracy, when we had to ride in the field house, I'm just in there like everybody else. The Europeans had a friend, Ducky, over in the bleachers, and I jumped up on the boxing ring and looked around and just yelled, charge. You know, for that, I got a little extra time because everybody remembered instead of the police too. But everybody in the prison remember it as one of the youngest guys in the prison taking charge of everything. When it was in the heat of everything, and I, I didn't have any idea why I jumped up and said, looked around and said, charge. None whatsoever. But when I got out on March 7th, 1965, I knew why I'd done an extra year. Because if I would have got out in 64, I just accepted that uh, Nation of Islam stuff, but it wasn't deep enough. When I came home, I didn't smoke, I didn't drink, and I had the same type of discipline I have now, lifting weights and all that stuff. And uh, my best friend that was a boxer, we started going up in the hills and running instead of running at the lake, you know. The same thing I do now. So that was, I see now why I stayed an extra year. And am I glad? Absolutely glad, very, very glad that I stayed an extra year. Because when I got out, I saw one of the brothers, we just called him Brother Puff, in the county jail in L.A. And uh, I was getting ready to go back to McNeil Island. And we was talking. I said, man... How long you uh how long you stay out? He said, Man, I ain't stayed out but such and such. I said, Yeah, I was out eight years. He looked at eight years. Eight years. That's when I was doing all that stuff. Then I was coming back from South America. In that eight years, I had did went overseas, uh, East Oakland Enterprises, become very wealthy. You know, all of that stuff, I, I had done that within that eight years. 
you know, from 65 to 73, I had did all of that a whole lifetime and none of my friends wasn't out over two, three weeks or a month or a few years. They all back and forth. Anyway, so that was, there's a reason. Okay. The other thing I want to mention is the attitude of sleeping under a bridge. We all know this in our literature. That was the attitude, not to pass gold, but that was the attitude that we had arranged for ourselves for this period, that we're getting ready to move to another period. Now, it's a few years ago. So we have to be prepared to sleep under a bridge. And psychologically, that's almost what I wanted to be doing, is sleeping under a bridge. Because I know myself, and I know if I'm sleeping under a bridge, it's all over. I mean, I'm going to work like, you know, that's all I'm going to do is come back. You know, setback ain't nothing but a setup for a comeback. You know, that was just psychologically. All the comebacks I made have never been from uh, sleeping under a bridge. You know, when I left the country, you watch Superfly. Superfly run off with $150,000. That's in those days. That would be the same as 1.5 million now. And that's after distress, after distress, after distress. That's, that's after, I don't know if I showed you the arrest list how many times I was. <laughs> that's after all of that. I still leave with that. That's after East Oakland Enterprises. That's after helping everybody, you know, that Godfather stuff. Well, I want to start a business. Or my boxing friends, I say, hey, why don't you uh, uh, have your trainer provoke? Why don't you have Mr. Moore just promote some fights? Uh, we don't have the money. Well, here you go. Y'all just promote. And uh, till they saw that they wasn't promoters, I would front them, just give me what I gave you back uh, if you can. And then, you know, in other words, whoever wanted to do something, they got it. Now, the other Negroes didn't do that. All the big Negroes, they didn't do that. Now, if we were to measure how people came out, if I leave with 1.5 million, that was the, before people was getting super big money, you know, like in the mid 70s and later, early 80s. And then after that, you can't get hardly no money now, but you know, people selling crack out there and all that. That's uh, like uh, minimum wage work. No, when I used to sell matchboxes of marijuana, matchboxes, you know, little bit, I bought two Cadillacs. I got rich selling matchboxes and because uh, that's what they wanted to do. By the way, let me get back to the crux of the story. My friends, two of them, borrowed. One is dead, so I'll mention his name. Jesse Lee, big, tall guy. They borrowed $200 from me in 1966. I was working down at the box company. Uh, and in fact, I had gotten wealthy just working overtime and saving my money. Anyway, they borrowed $200. They paid me the $200 back. And then they gave me $500 worth of marijuana, already bagged up and everything. So, remember, I didn't smoke weed. I didn't have nothing to do with, with it, all that. I ate no pork. I didn't do none of that. I didn't drink. I didn't do none of that. I was actually a, what they call a black Muslim. So anyway, of course, I was getting high going, taking them to the temple, but I wasn't paying that much attention. I mean, you can't f do no fishing if you, you can't make the Negro live righteous right away. You got to take time. Anyway, 
Anyway, now think about it. All the money that we acquired, nobody else acquired that kind of money. And when they did, they kept it for themselves. Now we spread the money out, like they used to say. Because I came to the conclusion in those years, because I sold that $500 worth of marijuana, and at that time, you made $100 a week. So I said, man, that's pretty good. So then after I started selling smoke, I got on a, you know, the way they changed the shifts. I was on a night shift from, from seven, late, seven at night, I guess, uh, up until in the morning. The night shift, whatever that is. Yeah, that's it, 11 to 7. So, I was home all day. And, I, and, and that week, I made $1,500. You got to imagine, this is, I'm talking about 66 and all that. That's like uh, uh, 15000 now. It's the same as 15000 if you match it with how much the cars cost, how much the houses cost, how much the rent was, the rent, two bedroom, brand new apartment, wall to wall carpet, was a hundred dollars, a hundred and ten dollars. That's what you paid. It was a hundred and ten dollars, and you made four hundred dollars, so you didn't pay nothing. It was just fun, anyway. So I made fifteen hundred dollars. You know, because I'm home all day, and everybody come, they wake me up, and then, I, and, hey, man, you got it? Yeah, here you go. Shoot, I quit right away. It wasn't hardly no time. I quit that job. You know, I quit that job, and I was gone. But anyway, I'm going to try to speed this up, because one of the things that I discovered when I got to be kind of, you know, up there. I looked at all the Negroes, the big Negroes, and I said, man, if these guys would have been born in another environment, another, they would be, I use the term in my own mind, captains of industry. Now remember, I studied and read all it even then, you know what I mean, I, I was studying then. I said they would be captains of industry, which is true. The same thing I say about them today. If our people would have got into what we got into, those guys, they would have been super big. I mean, you got to look at where we are. We're, we're in the world, we're on the world stage here. We're in the United States, out of the Negro community, ain't nobody getting the attention that we are here. Absolutely nobody, unless we're just missing the boat. I haven't heard about it, and I haven't seen it, and if they're not getting that many cases, they're not getting all these fines, they're not getting what we're getting here. They're not getting it, because if they was, they would be talking about it. You know, they would be saying, man, the police come by, let me, I got five fines, you know what I mean? They doing this, they doing, they would be talking about it. Or somebody would be writing about it. You know what I'm saying? That's, so ain't nobody, we, we're not a, a myth here. We're actually, we're living through this. Okay? But now remember, maybe other people wouldn't, like this, but the hadith is clear uh, about one about delay. That Allah like people to delay in a certain, or we delay. The other thing about self contentment, that if you do Allah's work, right, Allah gonna make sure, He gonna close up the door to your poverty, he, you ain't gonna be without no money. Right? And then you're going to be content, self-content. 
That's true. That's really actually true. But if you don't do it, you're going to be working and you still ain't going to have no money. You're going to be paying bills. You know, you're going to be all that. <laughs> That's what the Hadith say. So for us, this is a leisure. This is really, really leisure. You can kind of get a feel because you could tell how things are going. You know, you can tell if people are stressed out. My partner that took over the party after uh, P. O'Neill, he took a picture of me when I first came to Algeria. Man, I was all scrunched up and mean. And when I saw him later a couple of years ago in Tanzania, he said, man, let me give you this picture. Look at what you was looking like then. I was mad. I was, I'd been under all that governmental pressure. You see all them arrests, arrest after arrest. I was mad then. That was then. That was then. That was 1971. That ain't now, right? We deal with 50 times as much as that stuff then. But it wasn't clear. That was an educational period. You know, that was, that was a real training period. That was my elementary teaching. When I come through that, I was ready for just about everything else. That whole period of inside the United States, outside the United States, down to South America, and then up here, then I go to prison. You see what I mean? When I go to prison in 73, 74, something like that, hey man, and when we come out, there's a long period, we call it wandering in the wilderness. It's not wandering in the wilderness, it's like the movement is over, what are you going to do? You know what I discovered? Especially when I was in South America. I said, a white man know where I am and what I'm doing and what I, and he's, he's running this. And then I used to get mad because they would have the police, you know what I mean, and they, wouldn't, they would be scaring you. Now, I got a house full of cocaine, so I, I'm actually scared. You know, not scared like they're going to hurt me scared, but scared like, man, if they get all my dope and they was playing with me they played with me they would be playing when I'd get up every morning to go run they was playing with me when I was in uh, Mexico they would be playing with me when I was in Venezuela they would be playing now remember all the time I'm overseas I got uh, uh, I got uh, Carlos's mini manual, uh, selected works, Chairman Mao's tongue. I'm studying all the time. Later on, I was in Curacao. I was coming back down here and I got a book called The Magic of Thinking Big. It's like thinking grow rich, that type of book. And I was reading that. And at that time, I said, man, if I'd have had this book, a little while ago, I would, you know, because it, it do this, do that, da, 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 think things out. I was doing all of that. I read that book, and that book became a companion like. Because remember, I'm by myself most of the time. Yeah, like I have a team come by, they stay a while, we pack them up and send them back. Maybe I come up to the Mexican border because I wouldn't come on this side and I'd have a meeting with everybody, then I go back down. So I spent a lot of time technically by myself. So I'll get to the point in a minute. One, number one, the brothers would have been captains of industry. And number two, we had to figure out what we were going to do. The movement is dead. When I go back to Africa in 73, 
First, I went to Algeria. I didn't even know the brothers was gone. I went back to Algeria. And uh, I said, take me to the Black Panther headquarters. Black Panther, Black Panther. The guy was acting funny. So I knew how to get there. I told him, go this way, that way. He went there. It was nobody there. The place was closed. It's okay. So I stayed a while, then I realized that they was all gone. So I sent my little old sister back, and then, in fact, I ain't never seen her since. Then I went to uh, uh, East Africa. I went to East Africa, because that's where I had went when I, and there was some of the, so the brother told me what happened. Pete O'Neill, he took over, in 72, when Eldridge stepped down as leader of the party, he, he, he's the one. You probably saw the Panther in Africa or something like that. Yeah, there's a video about it. So we became best friends. So I came back to take them money because I had told them when we was in Algeria, I said, well, uh, we had a meeting. First thing I told them, I said, uh, there's a white girl. This, I said, this is the first time I've been upstairs and this is a secure area. I said, but on the balcony is a white girl hanging over there drinking a mint julep or something almost all the time. In other words, you're not being secure. You're letting, you know what I mean, a possible enemy, which is 95% possibility. I said, plus you can't have a revolution going down to the Rudy Douche Murad every day, the street, and buying hashish. You can't be high. And then I told them physical fitness, y'all, because I out on the beach every day running and stuff like that. And I said, you can't have no revolution like that, you know. And then I said, uh, what are we going to do about money? Now, remember, I didn't gave him a stack of money already. I already gave him a stack of money. So, I said, he said, what suggestions do you have? I said, well, uh, we could, uh, you know, we could establish a drug smuggling cartel. And that'll give us tons of money. I got all the distribution in, in California and everywhere else. So half the people, they didn't say nothing, but they was for that all the way. But uh, they said, no, we couldn't do that. It's against the principles of the party. Da, da, da. I said, that's all right. I'll go do it myself then. The, so that's what I did. I left there, went to Tanzania for a while, hung out in black Africa. Then I went up to Europe, hung out there for a while, or Scandinavia. Then I went to South America. And that's what I did. I'm, what I'm saying, that's exactly what I did. I established a cocaine smuggling cartel. There's no Negro did it before or after. Just think about it. You don't read about no... You read about blacks selling a lot of cocaine, but they buying it from Colombians. Ain't nobody went down there. Nobody, can you imagine? Nobody having the adventurism to go down there and say, hey man, we gonna hook it up. Anyway, it's a long story. So <clears throat> we did that. Sometimes people get a second chance. My second chance was when I was uh, thinking, okay, when I came back from Africa, the rebellion is over. You know, the party's dead, ain't nobody even, nobody even thinking about the <laughs> rebellion. So the only thing is, I'm rebellion orientated now. I'm I'm into this. I don't make no difference what they into, but I'm into it. So I come to the conclusion, 
that I cannot work underground because the underground, I was, remember, they had all the movements in. Uh, Red Brigade, Biter Meinhof Gang, they had a lot of people blowing up stuff, all that, blowing up airliners, that, that stuff was big then. You know, so, and I happened to be working with my partners with Jews, so we had, the only arguments we ever had was about Palestine. You know, I said, no, they got a right. They shouldn't blow up plants. I said, what do you mean? Y'all shouldn't be in there. What's the name? What are you talking about? You know, so we actually we was politically correct even then. So anyway, we had to find where are we going to fit in this. You know, that's what wandering in the wilderness do. There's no more movement either here inside the U.S., you can tell it's dying down. By 73, they didn't made, 72, they didn't made Superfly. And I can tell by the people that's coming down that there ain't, ain't no rebellion going on. So now what are you going to do? This is the thing. That's what wandering in the wilderness means. So there are certain things. You can't work underground because if you work underground, all you can do is be mad and blow up a building, you know what I mean, and stuff like that. I said, I ain't into that, you know what I mean. Shootouts with the police, and you're in there, and uh, 10,000 police outside, and they drag you out all bloody and looking stupid. I said, that ain't my type of, I ain't into that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I just, you know what I mean. I just said, oh, no. So I had to work above ground. That means I got to come back and clear up my cases here that I had here. So I came back and cleared them up. All that time, I had time to study the people that were in Leavenworth with me and up there on McNeil Island. They would, we would have classes and I would study uh, what most of the brothers was in the Dar. They was in 75, 74, they was at uh, Leavenworth. And when I was on the West Coast, the deputy warden just jumped up and sent me to Leavenworth. Well, they had the record and they said, this guy has too much power and everybody knows him on the West Coast. That's why they sent me to Leavenworth. It was, in those days, Leavenworth was called the end of the world. Now they got all kind of, but Leavenworth, they had Marion if you was just acting real silly. But if you just a normal, we don't like you, that's why they sent me to Leavenworth. They don't know what they do be doing. When I moved, when I came from Leavenworth, guess what I get in contact with? First is the Sunni Muslims. The Sunnis. Guess who Sunni Muslims are? All the people from the movement. So we get a chance to go over it. It's an education. What happened a few years ago? You know, how did this happen? How did that, what is, the, you know, what do we have? It was an education. I wasn't getting that on McNeil Island because the federal penitentiary out that way, everybody was uh, there for gangsterism and uh, other stuff. But they weren't there for rebellion. But in Leavenworth, those was the heart. I'm telling you, the Puerto Rican Liberation Movement, the little guys that, that, that uh, they shot up to Congress in 1950, they was in Leavenworth with me. Yeah. And one of my partners who was a Latino, he used to hang around with him. He'd say, hey, this is so-and-so. So he introduced me to these guys. And, uh, well, there was one there at that time. And the lady that was with them, when I was at Leavenworth, they offered to let them all go if they said they were sorry or something. And that lady said, you can kiss I Sorry. I said, yeah. She said, yeah, I'm sorry that we didn't get our freedom. <laughs> but as far as, you know, I mean, they shot up to Congress in 1950. You read it about, you ever hear about, it? they walked down there and they shot up to Congress. Uh, they was revolutionaries for liberation of Puerto Rico. Anyway, 
that wandering in the wilderness was a special time because you had to figure out what you were going to do. What direction? Well, I became, when I got there, I was a nation listener. Well, the, the, the lamb had just passed away in 74, I think it was, 74, 75. Yes, yeah, so, so the chief was in, and the chief was bringing everybody to the to the sunnah, but he was bringing everybody slow. He was really, he was stalling all he could. But anyway, to him it was fast, but to us it was slow. So when I was in Leavenworth, I remember I was in building 53, that's the, the receiving. So I told the brothers, I said, yeah, come on down, we doing, I'm doing fishing. We having a meeting at the He said, yeah, well, come on down with us. I said, us? Who is you? He, uh, uh, we the Sunnis. The Sunnis? Who the hell is the Sunnis? What's wrong with y'all? Uh, you know, they didn't have no Sunnis in California. Sorry to say, not a one. Huh? It was pitiful. All the Sunnis. But guess what? When I was in Leavenworth, Islamic Party was there. And uh, Darul Islam. So I got a whole picture of, hey, this is the way to go. We see the next step. The next step is Islam. But not that the black man is God stuff, but really like real revolutionary Islam. Because anyway... So I kind of had a feeling of where we're going. But anyway, still there's a lot of changes. By the time we opened the masjid in 1980, we were ready to roll. We didn't got educated. Now I'll pick up a little bit. Basically what I'm saying is this. He said, oh my people, I am no imbecile, but I am a messenger from the Lord and cherish of the worlds. But I fulfill towards you the duties of my Lord's mission. I am to you a sincere advisor. Do you wonder that there had come to you a message from your Lord through a man of your own people? This is the problem. This is the problem right now. I don't want to sound that I'm black. What's so, all? Yeah. Let's face it. Camera, I'm black. Come from a colored background. You know what? When I became a Sunni Muslim, everybody was telling us, you have to know Arabic. And I personally didn't learn Arabic for years just because they was telling me you got to be a in order, that's why I slur it right now. I've been doing this stuff for a long time. I mean, I got my dictionary. I know what it means. And I, I had two years of this stuff. But all the people that went overseas to study Arabic went to Saudi Arabia, went to Syria. Zaid and them went to Syria, and all the rest of the Negroes went to Saudi Arabia. And you can't find one of them doing anything. They don't do nothing. And I saw that from the time I saw Sheikh Kidra come back and the people running the Hadith real well and they wasn't doing nothing. So oh, I don't want that kind of Islam. Oh, indeed. So remember Sayyid Qutb and Ride. That each thing you go through in life, each event carries you to another stage in life that you were predetermined to go there. Joseph and his brothers sold him into slavery. Because for him to come over the storehouses, right, in Egypt, he's got to go through the changes he got. So they bought him a ticket. 
they gave him a ride. That's what they did, right? Because he was predetermined. Because remember, okay, we're going to teach you about all these events and you're going to see the sun, the moon, 11 stars and all that and make obesis and you're going to be a big shot. Well, how are you going to be a big shot? You need a ticket to get over to Egypt, right? And you have to have circumstances circling around you, right? that forms and shapes your character. You're already a pre-prophet. By the time you get there and start teaching the truth, you're uh, commissioned, right? But you got to go through different changes because you have a statement to make. Hey, king, put me over the storehouses because I know their value. Let me have a count of all of this stuff because I know what's happening. I'll manage this stuff according to its need. I'll take care of all of that, right? Before you, we go through all of that, we want you to clear up all of this stuff with the girls, right? Now you gotta imagine, in Oakland, they always had girl stuff. Girl, this girl, all that. Everybody going, who going with who? What is it? You ain't never had none of that here. Never. We just don't have, I said, no, 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 no. It's, they'd never been able to arrange any stupid stuff like that. I used to refer to Oakland as, as the masjid turns. You know, that's programmed, the world turns. There's a, Soap opera. That's the way Oakland, we, vi we saw Oakland like that. And everybody that was there was into that type of thing. And not here, we can be into this or that, but we ain't never been into nothing like that here. It just, we ain't putting up with it. That stuff, that's children's play. Ain't nobody gonna be bothered with that. So now, do you wonder that there had come to you a message from your Lord through a man of your own people. It ain't going to be no more prophets and messes. Prophet Muhammad, we say it every week. Hatam and Nabiyin. He's a seal. He's a locker on the prophets. Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is kafata and lil nas, the prophet to the people, to humanity. But then there are going to become people with, that get flashes, and good visions, remember we taught a lesson on that, good visions. Good visions is minwari hijab, from behind a veil. It's not in words, like words like, uh, the, the, you know, like uh, the messengers get, they get stuff. But there are three stages of this, and the first two is open to all of us. So good visions, good visions it's like when it says right here, and gave you a stature tall amongst the nations. I am not a black nationalist, but I have always liked our people and I want our people to get a piece of this future world right now. Yeah, yeah like stand tall. This is what, this is my personal, I want niggas to be big. It's not new. That's what we wanted. Everybody wanted money. So when we had a lot of money, we tried to make it, and they did. The people had money. That The best employment thing they ever had in Oakland was when we just, everybody, we used the money and we didn't get less money. We got, there's a man, that nigga throwing all that money away, giving all that money. I wasn't giving nothing away. And then, it's just like zakat. You put it out and it come back. You put it out, there's money coming, swirling around. So it wasn't even no Negroes in those days that had $150,000. When I left the country, I had $150,000 to leave with after going to jail two or 300 times, after the police following me and bugging my phone and, and 
being up on the telephone post outside of your house, because that meant that there was a PG&E like Pepco. They, they just, you know, those people was the, the police, you know, and they used to look at you, and so you get paranoid. You may not believe it. You know how you see LA, they had them helicopters. The helicopter would fly over my house and make the house shake. It would get down just, it's right there, everybody in the house is there, paranoid. They used to do that to my house. They'd fly, right, they couldn't have been no more than 25, 30 feet above the house. You could hear the blaze whirling and the trees pushing all back, you know what I mean? And it, uh, I'll admit it, in those days you'd be mad. And uh, it'd scare your family to death too. Because a lot of people are not into this revolutionary stuff. They just, uh, just want to live. The, the human being want to live a comfortable life. The human being is not built to fight systems. They're just not built for it. Okay. So when you run up across it, I'll get to what we're talking about in just one second. What we're talking about is recruitment of all the people that's been involved in this fiasco for the last 20, 25 years. Yeah, we're gonna have interviews. Everybody's welcome. I mean, everybody that was acting a fool including Mukhtar and them, because you got to remember, I told Mukhtar and them years ago, I said, I'm going to help y'all. You know why? This has been in the plan for a long time. And everything that's happened was to, uh, to expose how it works to expose the people involved, but not to hold the people, uh, it's not accountable, but not, remember, people are people. You can't stop people from being people. People are not built to, they didn't, uh, it wasn't nobody but Moses arguing with Pharaoh, right? Everybody else was, hey man, right? I mean, it ain't no picnic here, but, uh, he was the only one talking about letting my people go, right? The other, they might have just got used to being there. How many slaves run off from down in Dixie? Well, technically, this is Dixie too, you know. The Mason-Dixon line is up there in Maryland somewhere, up there by, not Gaithersburg. But, uh, it is up that way by... Uh, I think it in the town past Gaithersburg. But that's the, the Mason Dixon line is up there. This is below the Mason Dixon line. And they had to free the slaves in D.C. first. Remember the first? Good God Almighty. Talking about in Maryland. Wasn't no slave state, but I, but they was fighting with them in Delaware, way up there. Delaware was a slave state. Good God Almighty. Now, they said, Oh, Sally, thou hast been of us the center of our hopes. Here too, dost thou now forbid us the worship of what our fathers worshiped? But we are really in suspicious disquieting doubt as to that which thou invite us. So here's Paul Sally. He was the center of their hopes. Now the Negro here was the center of everybody's hopes too. The richest man in the, in the region in Northern California and spending it. So hey man, we that's why when I come home, everybody was, I can't, like that yellow, yellow Volkswagen out there, I came home from driving the biggest cars they made to driving a Volkswagen. 
this uh, hmm. they was just uh, dumbfounded, right? And everybody, when I go to the masjid later on, everybody was asking me to help them get over. I said, get over. I said, I come to the masjid to get salvation and brotherhood. I said, man, you can help me. I said, good God Almighty. And the same people that was asking me, they talk about me now like uh, you ain't with the chief. I said, what do you mean I wasn't with the chief? I wasn't selling dope. Well, I ain't say they were selling dope. But, you know, I could tell what people is doing coming to the back door. And then I come home there, I like to donate to the you know, so I donated to the masjid needed a paint job, big building. So I donated a masterpiece. It must have been 15 years before the masjid got painted in Oakland. I had went back to the penitentiary, got out, and was had I opened our masjid <laughs> for years before that masjid got painted. But I was a bad guy. Because I wasn't with the chief. That was during the days, I guess y'all would remember riboflavin and ox and box, oxygen, hydrogen, you know, gins. You don't remember those, do you? You remember that teaching. See, you missed a lot. Oh, my goodness. Can I stray a second? You know, hydrogen. That's an agen. No, hydrogen. That's a hydro water. It's a water gen. And Jesus is a, a, a land man. And John the Baptist was a water man. Don't worry about making sense. Hydrogen and oxygen. Oxygen? That's an agen. You didn't know that. That's, a, that's what I'm talking about. Y'all got to get up, man. Look at here. Man, you missed. <laughs> you know, the chief did a program, and I repeated those words on the radio. On another, uh, boy, they was mad because when you said it, you know, they would be sitting there. Yeah, man. Now we all friends. Now we was always friends, but I wasn't putting up. I said, no, man. I didn't read the Quran a couple of times and Hadith. And I, I'm not into that. Hydrogens, oxygen, riboflavin, rib. See, y'all don't remember that stuff. That stuff, man, the chief be stretching out. The chief was a good man. But uh, anyway, so yet however strongly thou mayest desire it, most people will not believe in this revelation, although thou dost not ask of them any reward for it, it is but Allah's reminder to all mankind. But then, how many a sign is there in the heavens and on earth which they pass by unknowingly and on which they turn their backs? And most of them do not even believe what also ascribing divine powers to other beings. They, it's kind of like kind of mushrikeen. That means you can, your race can be your illa, your job can be your, you know, the white man can be your God. Yeah, your illa. In fact, most people is. But uh, let me skip a minute. Just let's look at what's going on in the world today. Let's imagine our own history. You know, what we have taught, the articles that we have written, and what we've been dealing with here. It's been pretty accurate. 
It's been very accurate. Okay, now, some things happen in a way that, uh, say like January the 3rd, when they assassinated uh, Aga Suleimani, Qasem Suleimani. His assassination produced 10 times as much as he would have did when he was alive. It unified all, everybody in that, right? It unified them. And it brought the people together so that they were ready to stand what they got right now. And they stand it and they roll in like the United States is not doing as good as Iran. They're not doing anywhere as good as Iran for Iran. So the assassination of Qasem Soleimani produced more with his martyrdom than he could have produced. The harmonization of certain movements, right? The getting all that, he couldn't have did it. Or he was trying to do it, but his martyrdom solidified it instantaneously. Now, we've been sitting here for years telling the people, you got to look at the world situation. Hey, man, certain things the people is going to Najaf and Karbala by the millions. This is what it means. And we mentioned what it meant. And it came out meaning just what we said it did. Forget about all the old stuff, uh, Lebanon and Hezbollah and the defeat of the Zionists. And to, forget all of that. What I'm trying to say is there is nobody even close. They don't even talk about the subjects that we talk about, right? I mean, if I start lying, just say, I think you tell a little story there, you mammals. No, I don't. From my research, they don't even talk about it, these things, in the same way or close to it as we do. None of the people that's here in America, neither the Iranians nor the mixed community. And how is it that nobody will even put their hands on us? I mean, not that we want people to lay hands on us, nothing like that. How is it that we're excluded from everything Islamic? And it seems like we're the only ones that's carrying the flag of Islam. How, or how could it even happen, right? Now, here's what we say. All of this was for a reason. All of this was to teach people, you don't have to be afraid of boss man. One person said downstairs, he's a nice guy. He said, Imam Musa, if you had a couple of thousand, hundred thousand followers, they would kill you. I said, it's all right, it don't make no difference. You know, which is, at that time would be kind of true. A few years ago, we didn't let everybody roll right through here and come, hang out, and go. All those people are welcome back. From now until a few months from now, we're going to be having interviews to welcome everybody back. Why? Why is that? Because we want the Negro to have, let me find it right here. Do you wonder that there had come uh, to you a message from your Lord through a man of your own people to warn you? Call in remembrance that he made you inheritors after the people of Noah and gave you a stature tall amongst nations. Uh, do you notice I was given a talk at well, not 
in, but around, actually out on the field, the play field. At the university, uh, Medellin in 1978, I just went back down there for a while. This is the University Libre. And uh, who's talking about uh, blacks in America and what have you? And I said, no, uh, that was interbreeding going on. Because they was like, why can black people run so fast and jump so high? And one of the guys had been to school here. He went to high school here. I said, well, one of the things was uh, just like you grow animals on the farm and you breed them to be bigger and small. I said, that's the way they did us. And I know particularly because my great, 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 great grandfather was born in 1800. He was a stud on the plantation. When the Civil War came, he didn't want to fight nobody. Well, he was up in his 60s, but my uncles all fought in the Civil War. They all fought in the Civil War. You see the band of angels, some type of guys. All of them fought. One of them was born the year the stars fell. If you look at uh, the almanac, it was 1831, 1833. They had a meteor shower, a big meteor shower. Now the Negro don't, didn't know anything about science. So that uncle, great, great uncle, was born the year the stars fell. That's what they called it. He said they was bouncing around. Well, there was a meteor shower. You look in the almanac. Remember they used to have them almanacs. You could... And they asked what it had, yeah. And I looked in there. That was the year they had a big media shower. And so they fought in the Civil War. And my father told me all that history. Because I took a tape back in the 80s before he passed away. And, uh, you know, I just got all of our history on tape. I still got them now. But anyway... We're losing a lot of that. We're losing not all of it, but most of it. Black people don't have the, even if they're telling kind of the truth, we got every, we're dying like flies. Black people used to could put them in oil and everything. They'd still be alive, you know. <laughs> now they, the wind blowing, niggas be dying, right? That was never. The only time they had a white heavyweight champion was by accident a few years back, right? Now they got everybody heavyweight championship. And the lightweights is all Mexicans and everybody, right? Why? We're different than we was. We're losing that. What we got all that uh, might as well have been inoculation, all that protection of slavery, all that, you know, we got, we were strong. We had tapeworms and all that, you know, tapeworm eat up all your food. And uh, we got through all kind of stuff, man. Now we're losing that. But the Quran is clear on that. He will exchange you with another people. We had an opportunity at civil rights. We had an opportunity. We have to get back on our job. Black people, when they used to talk about Islam in America, it was black people. Now they don't come to Negroes at all. They go to Arabs and other people, right? Yeah, they do. And it don't matter what they do. You know, uh, I digress just one. So I just listened to the news before I got here and I'm reading too. Uh, they slipped some name, they, one of the third names in, from Saudi Arabia about, uh, he, he, yeah. I, I heard it, but I missed the name, but I heard yeah. they were talking. Yeah, they was talking about the guy that Saudi, okay. When they had 911, 
the guys was having lap dances, San Diego. They was, you know, 15 of them, they say, was from Saudi Arabia. Within a month, they invaded Afghanistan. What? The only people who could lead the United States was Saudis. You get a little bit from the newspaper last year. It said that the 28 pages that was missing from the investigation. They knew that the Saudis did it. The New York court gave some of the money, Iranian money, to them. Don't have nothing to do with Iran, <laughs> but that just shows you how crackpottish these people are. Anyway, like I say, we're not, let's call it a black nationalist type, but we are located here in the Southeast, and we want the people to get a chance. We want the people, so right now, all those people, Abdul Malik, Mukhtar, all the brothers out there, and the brothers here. Why not? We all know each other, right? So when this go off for the next few months, we're having interviews. You want to interview, you come and interview. Imam Musa will interview you. Well, and we won't even mention Let's see, you did a little tattletail in here, a little tattletail. Good God Almighty, it's a pretty bad record. But no, no, no. We know each other. You know, the first thing, if you got caught doing something and you was in jail, you said, man, if I just had one more chance. That's what niggas say. If they had one more chance, they'd be like the people in the Quran. You say, if I just had a goodly child, and if that, 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 as soon as that's over, right, you back running in the street. Same thing, at which they do. Here's a, uh, Allah forgives. And remember, you, you cannot, uh, you can't blame human beings for being human beings. You just can't do it. I was telling my son out there in California, I said, if you shot every nigga because he was a nigga, you would shoot everybody. He can't, how he, who else is he going to be? What does he run across, right? How did he know any, he don't know nothing. They didn't cut off all the avenues of any light and any time any one of them try to do something, they do wind up dead uh, somewhere. They don't be on the front page unless they just so-and-so swallowed some pills and he died or he hung himself. But you got to look at this, where we live. I want you to look at just where we live. They let the boy Michael Brown lay on the ground for over four hours and wouldn't even cover him up with a blanket or nothing. Look, stature, you don't have no stature, period. They shot another 25-year-old fella down there and wasn't going to put nobody in jail unless, the, I don't know, the guy helping them might have just, I don't know how he gave them the video, but they've been, the policemen had the video all the time. I'd have heard, okay, look. So when we're talking to you, dear brothers, the Negro right now, this may be your last chance because Allah is changing. You can see it in front of you. Our neighborhood are changing to different neighborhoods. Other people are coming in and we're being diffused all over the place. In every city in America, all the downtowns, all the places you could stay for a little or nothing, they're all going. 
We don't have any representatives anywhere to stand up for us. Well, anything. There's no Negroes even saying that I hear. They, maybe WPFW, they, they humble a little bit and mumble. Yeah, I don't like those. But they, they said, that, oh, it's, sometimes it's two and a half times as many Negroes dying. Sometimes it's four times as many dying as anybody else. Only one city up in Rhode Island, they said 44% of the people dying up there is Latinos and they only a uh, certain amount of percent. And then the people, what Don them say, they're not part of my uh, constituency, whatever it is. They're not none of my base. So why should he fix anything? Hey, the people is dying is old, they're going to produce nothing else. They black, it don't cost millions because they got maybe less another 20 years, that's all outgo, right? <laughs> and they Latinos <laughs> and Asians, you know, kind of mixed with black, uh, you know, and all that stuff. So this is what we're saying. Said Kutub called it a riot. Then the other thing, Wahum La Yasharuna, they didn't know, understand what they were doing. All the stuff that produced what we have right here was all engineered by the system. All we had to do was fall in line with what our character was and it just got stronger and better and now we're an example you don't have to be afraid of that European and you got more sense than all of their whole government now imagine now just try to imagine their highest echelon of civil servants and politicians. Their professors, pardon the street, what information that's being put out is more accurate? Ours or theirs? It's a simple question. Who's more accurate? That means we know more than the whole collection of white folks, and it's been like that. But not only that, we have been blessed with the biggest configuration of misfits and buffoons in the history of America. Now, I'm optimistic and stuff like that. I didn't expect it to be this good. I didn't expect, I'm, I ain't going to lie. I did not expect, and I prayed for it. You remember? I prayed for this stuff, make clown, buffoon. But this thing, watching these people, you can see idiocy, meanness. You can see Adolf Hitler Jr. And America, you got to remember, America is fitting into what happened to uh, Germany. Germany lost World War I. They made them pay all this money. Da, 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 da. They had all kind of fitting going on in Germany. And so the rich folks looked around and said, look at that clown. And they pulled in Adolf Hitler. And then he got to be chancellor. Then he burned the Reichstag. That's the Congress over there. Blamed it on communists and everybody else, right? And he said, now I have to defend the fatherland. So we have the World Trade Center. We have a little something every other week to remind them, I have to defend America, right? It's the Hitler playbook, man. And then the white folks that's poor and slow, they thinking he on his side, he using them 
I mean, we got a big job. We got to tell them they're slow white folks, man. They're thinking Don is on their team. And Don just trying, if one thing about Don, you can tell, he don't care about nobody but Don. If he care about himself. Don ain't care, he don't care about his wife, his kids, his little kid. You know, right? Don don't care. Don has all the emotional problems. You ever see him on TV? The other day, the white lady, the Chinaman lady, you see, the Chinaman lady said, uh, well, what da, 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 da. He said, you go ask China. Finally, the lady said, uh, why did you say that to me? You ought to know why I said it to you. Yeah. And uh, then the other white lady, uh, 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 you go on talk. Not you. No, 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 no. You can't talk. And Don walk off the stage. Did you see him? He just turn around and say, bump y'all. The white women ran him off the stage. The man's a coward. He's a coward. And he's going, he ain't going crazy. See, if you already, cra you can't go crazy. You can't, he can't go crazy. You know, that would be an upshift. The man, look, look at the crew, Pompeo, look at the laws bar. They had a man say, well, you didn't plead guilty to two charges, so now we're going to throw that out. They got it for the Supreme Court now. This never happened. You see what they're doing? They say it never happened. I think 2,000, 200, something like that white officials, white folks in the government wrote a, they signed a thing to get rid of Barr, get rid of this man. Get rid of the man. Right? He make, uh, what was that, John Mitchell, Mitchell, that was Nixon's guy. Hey man, he make him look like, and Ed Meese, Reagan's uh, attorney general, he make them look like sterling human beings. And Pompeo, I don't want to get to it, but yesterday at, they had the little old Dr. Fauci, whatever his name was. He said everything that Donald Trump, not to mention the whistleblower today or uh, last week, right? They just said, no, that man, hey man. And the poor white lady, the lady that wore the scarf, do they had a camera on and then you could see her legs. You know when girls turn their feet toward each other, they are uncomfortable. This lady was turning her feet like that. That's when Don said, oh, we can, we can get some ultraviolet light on them and then what else? He said you can drink a little bit of that uh, <laughs> bleach juice. <laughs> Look, tell the truth. You can't find that nowhere. It, 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 it seems like this Saturday Night Live super, you don't have to make up nothing. Right? You can't, hey, you can't outdo it. And then, hey man, I used to like that uh, thing on TV, House of Cards, because it was, you can't, they stop having it. They, they, you can't do, you can't they just stop. They said it was one reason or another, no. You cannot top that. And the only one that would have brought straightness is that, that, that the black lady, Amoroso, somebody, you see, they scared of her. Because a black woman with a tongue like she got, they said, oh, this, you ain't heard from her since. They gave her about three days on TV, and Because that girl was ready to light up the whole thing, you know. And she could do it professionally. A black woman like her with her attitude. See, I wouldn't argue with no lady like that because they, they could use language that you couldn't use. You know what I mean? And then they talk all under your clothes. They do anything, man. And then you just have to say, sorry, lady, you won. You could have it. I'm gone. 
You can't, and that's the way they felt about her. You see, she's gone. You don't even hear of a book no more. You don't hear nothing about her. She's persona non grata. Okay. But in the midst of all of that, do you want them people making decisions about your children, your wives, your family, and your future? That's okay. Then why don't we change it? That's why we're doing what we're doing. Because everybody deserves a chance. That's what forgiveness is all about. That's what all this, that's what this Islam is about. You know? And the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he got to, to Mecca, he said, La Tatraba, no, but this La Tatraba goes on and on and on. It's not just one time. It was in Mecca. It's the whole attitude. In other words, for us to produce the type of world that we need, it's going to be certain things you needed. Nobody can do it by themselves. They just can't do it. But a team that know each other, you know, we know each other. Furkan and all of them, everybody run away out there to be back too. Everybody come on back. We'll give you a little interview. Job interview, of course. You got to remember. And we get going. Everybody here is, the people in California are so old, they ought to be happy to do it. All my friends out there, they ought to be happy. They, the ones that are from that, that era. I'm going to talk to some of my people. They're 80 years old. What are you scared of? Hell, you're 80 years old. Well, I didn't want to testify because you were 78 then, man. Dog. My friend, you're 78 years old. I don't want they to do something. They would, uh... I said, if you know they would do something to you because you testifying for me. Of course, they wouldn't. Uh, what about friendship? What is that? Uh, friendship, man. No. Why not be a little adventurous? That's why it says that Allah made the people inheritors after the people of Noah and gave you a stature tall amongst the nations. If we by ourselves to the people of little scarified people that do anything they want. I don't want to hear you, you're a nigger. That's what Care says. Only thing they did was took the Black Lives Matter sign down. Remember, they had a whole line of white people walking out of there and wouldn't even let us in. It's ridiculous. And every time we'd be out there talking, just having fun, of course. Remember, you got to have fun. Don't forget this. Let me write this down. Always have fun. And we got it written. Good part. We said this a long time ago. that we write in a good part, write your own book, right? Well, that's what the Quran says that too. Because you're going to read your own book and you're going to get your own book. Now, the angels are recording the book, but they're recording what you do. So you're writing your own book and that's the one you're going to get back. Now, what about this one? They got all kind of people. The Justice League and all them. Those people are not real. Tell the truth. What's happened here for the last 30 something years, is it real? It, I mean, does it seem like somebody could do that? Well, we did. It ain't nobody never even did nothing like that before to sit right there in front of the people and do the whole show. 
the Martin Luther King, them, the, the, the sit-in type, busted upside the head, right? The challenge demonstrations down there. Right? Oh, Imam Musa stole some money. What money? What money is that? We sent Negroes 35 dollars or $40,000 to California. He never raised even 30 cents. But we forget that because now we're into a new thing. But your behavior there was not good. But we're overlooking that. Why? Because you was colored then. You was cowardly then and silly. And so they underestimated us. They thought this is a nigga like everybody else. If everybody leave, you're going to be sad. You're going to be lonely. I said, these people are stupid. Mm -mm. The white man prepare you and Allah prepare the white man to prepare you. Send you to the hole all the time in jail. So you get used to what? Being by yourself, <laughs> right? You develop that becomes natural. If you go, everybody overseas was all lonely. I was never lonely. They all was lonely. They was lonely. They was in exile. They was lonely. I was just sitting there with it. They was lonely, lonely, lonely. Everybody was lonely. You go to a movie with America in it. I remember, y'all all know, Dr. John Brennan. Can you look up Dr. John Brennan? Dr. John Brennan. Brennan, be Brennan. He was the biggest Negro doctor in the United States almost. Brennan. He was in Africa with me. In fact, he was Edi Amin's doctor for a minute, Dr. John Brennan. I think he died in 94 or something like that. We was in Algeria together, East Africa together. Dr. John Brannion. He spoke French. He was edu educated in Lausanne, Switzerland. And uh, Dr. John Brannion. Anyway, B-R-A-N-I-O-N, something like that, Brannion. Anyway. Oh, what does it say? Huh? Well, he told us that they framed him, that he, they thought he killed his wife, you know, and he went, huh? He was a big Negro, Johnson Publications and all those. Those was his friends. He was that generation, the one right before us. But anyway, I want you to imagine the things that we've been dealing with here, right here. How long we've been dealing with it. And then the Quran is saying that we want you to become warithin. Uh, inheritors in the land, right? Inheritors, that's not inheritors. Says the same thing just about, let me see. Uh, and we made people considered weak and of no account. Inheritors of the land, both east and west. Lands where we sent down our blessings and the fair promise of thy Lord was fulfilled. Uh, then it goes on to say, for the Bani Israel, because they had patience and constancy, and we leveled the ground, the great works and fine buildings, which Pharaoh and his people had erected with such pride. Look, uh, what I'm talking about is a, a, a chance for us to... Uh, See, the old time Negro, if you gave him a chance, the superheroes are that for white folks, but the Negro is 
big time. We'd like for our people to get back their respect from an Islamic position and then go on and help everybody else reach their goal. The world that we want to live in uh, is being worked on right now. If you notice, everybody's talking about what comes after, what comes next, and how we can't have it like that. So this is probably going to go on long enough for people to demand a change. And we don't know how deep it's going to sink into all other types of fitna and panic. You know, just imagine tomorrow the, the statistics is going to come up. They're going to say so many people, the economy is going to go down. More people unemployed. It's, if, even if it's a million, might be five or six more. But this just opening up a couple of donut shops is not going to get have nothing to do with employment, right? And they have nothing to do with employment. The people, the inertia of direction means the thing is, keeps going even when you put on the brakes, the thing keeps going. Inside the car, everything keeps going. That's not locked down, right? This economy is going to continue to go to how far? We don't know. We don't know how much panic but we know even if it stopped right now, there's enough disconcerted uh, attitudes and behaviors that demand a change. We've been talking about a new world and influence in the directive change, direction of change for a long, long time. Direction of change don't mean an individual, it means a group of people. That's why we brought in Joseph, or Yusuf. Yusuf was a dreamer. Remember when I was in the hospital, hit in the head, I said, optimism. I, could, I didn't think that's the only word I could think of. Because, you know, they ask you, where are you? You got to think. Sometime you get it right. I'm going to up your hospital. What's your name? Mm, my name. It's a good question. Yeah, they, they, they ask all those questions until you can, until you can say them. Then they don't, they don't let you out before that. But you got to think. And believe it or not, you don't know your name. You don't know your name. You can't pray because you don't know nothing about, you don't know the Bismillah Rahman Rahim if you're lucky. But all the prayers, all the fiqh, you don't know none of that. You're just a blank slate. <laughs> Except optimism. Optimism. That's where we're going. And I know it's probably uncomfortable for you just to have to look at me sitting there, right? Yeah, it's just uncomfortable, man. Oh, ma'am. Not one drop of hatred or nothing else. You know why? That's what Allah had wrote for me to do that to get here. You can't have no hatred to do this stuff, to do this job. You're going to have to be a clean vessel, not spot clean, you know, not where you drink bleach and get real clean inside. <laughs> You're going to have to be a pretty good fella. You don't get that way by just uh, pop up and I'm all right. No, Allah is going to send you this. And you got to be prepared to go through it in order to get there. And everybody has to know it. Like here, all the Negroes know that if they left here, they left on their own. They know that there's nothing happened here to them. The only thing we would do to people is feed them to death and cuddle them to death, right? And give them gourmet food. That's the only thing they can say. The nigga just overfed us, man. And then I was getting fed. And then that's why I left. He can say that. 
put too much butter in all the food, you know, and stuff like that, right? And all the hot cakes will spoil up, or not hot cakes, the waffles with big fat thick ones, right? They could say all of that. That's what they could say. It would be true. No, they all swole up. Well, I make them like that. I make them real thick so when they go in the thing and all the eggs and all that make them, they puff up. But they're good, you know. That's the only thing they can say, man. See, I don't go to Masjid Al-Islam, man. They have all them color. They even call them Negro eggs. I ain't no Negro, man. I'm black. But we had them old eggs. I eat them. Just cause they there, but uh, you know, and all them old waffles all swole all up. Then them old old potatoes. You can't even get no potatoes. Tell the truth, you can't go to no restaurant and get smothered potatoes anymore. Can you? You can't. They don't make them. You can get them little patties, them little hash brown patat patties in the store. You can get those. But you can't get no potatoes that are simmered for like an uh, hour, half hour, with onions, bell peppers, and all. You just can't do it. You can't do it. And meat that fall off the bone and all that stuff. Mm -mm. That's all they could say. Tell the truth. Man, I ain't going over that no more, man. I'm trying to be on a diet, and then, you know, then I just get out of the pen, I ask for a little money, Niggas give you a little money, you know what I mean? Don't ask for nothing back and stuff like that. You know, I don't like it over there. That's, they could say that. Yeah. Say, this is my way resting upon conscious insight, accessible to reason. I am calling you to Allah and those who follow me. Now, limitless is Allah in his glory and I'm not of those who ascribe divinity to ought to him. I don't say the white man is God. He think he is. Well, he used to. Uh, the white woman ain't God or goddess. Ain't no, it ain't nothing like that. The job, Dr. So-and-so is not God. That's all we're saying. And I'll close with this. It, 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 it adds up to this. The ride we talk about. The ride is just like getting a ticket to take you to one destination after another. And that never stops as long as you're alive. You go from one event after another. And if you tune into a lot, you're going to get better and better and better. Each one. And this is accessible to reason. People can see. It ain't nobody. Do you think it's people out there that don't know what's going on here? Tell the truth. Do you think they don't understand? They understand perfectly. I think so too. I think every, now the thing is, no, but see, one of the things is if everybody work with the white man against the Negro, and it makes the Negro better, happier, and all that, that all the hadith that you see comes alive. Use a little delay. You're going to be content. You're going to be happy. And it's going to be your fun, your leisure. <laughs> it's going to be, right? Your hobby is going to be this. So it's going to be fun. Okay. It's got to be fun. Think about it. You make dua and Allah give you exactly what you ask for. And it's funny. You don't need what you're going to, I don't like that. You know, like people get, oh, Allah, give me a high yellow woman, a nice this and that. And you get a yellow woman and then you're mad. Well, why you didn't ask for that? The people used to pray for babies. Some of the people, they would just got to have babies. Then they get a baby and another baby and another. Uh, I said, "What? Well, you got what you asked for. You know, praying for babies. 
you didn't pray for a self-serving baby that had a big diapers, they clean, all, they clean themselves, you know, laugh at themselves. You didn't ask for that. You asked for a baby. And Allah gave you a baby and you ain't happy. That's insanity, right? It's insanity. So we got what we asked for and we're happy about it. We're just, okay. I'm going to do some closing here, but uh, we wrote a good part for everybody. Let's just call it not being selfish. Not only a good part for us, but remember, this thing is long range. Now, since everybody else is younger, okay, I plan to live another uh, 25 years easy, but that don't mean I'm going to be here, you know, shoot. Nigga may be gone tomorrow or anytime. You know, you don't have, that's just something that, that uh, I'm planning. Because 25 years, probably halfway, not finished the job, but you get a chance to see it take place. I think the accelerator is on because the things that we thought that would take to get to a certain place, we had no idea that the world was going to be put on freeze. Freeze. Just freeze. We had no idea. It's frozen. Now, we can look at that sign if we want. We can ignore it, but you know how the sign's been getting. Think about it. The sign's been getting tougher and tougher and tougher. And now this sign is global freeze. And the government got to give people money or else they're going to rebel. And after a while, the government going to get tired of giving away money, right? But it ain't giving away money. It's giving money to the stores because everybody go buy stuff and the store get bigger money. So it's helping the economy, right? But now you think what they're talking, this thing, California is saying no schools, some of the places are saying no schools, no university. Okay, all right. The death rate is going up. Everything is, you know, it's maybe 85,000 people now. And then they say it's undercounted. Okay. Uh, the prices are going up in the store. Already. The prices are going up. What about the millions of poor that don't have no money income now? See, there's a lot of millions of people getting money. They ain't getting enough. Okay. The crashes, the economy, the environment, this chance of people being home has given the people a chance to think about what is life? What am I, you know, what is this all about? You know? And then they get in a, a lot of them, they say, you got to go back to work. And they say, I ain't going back to work. I get more money if I stay home, right? So they're giving them a choice. What would you do? Hey, man, I get $3,000, $2,000 a week staying home. And I get uh, $1,700 by going to work. <laughs> so it's a hard decision, <laughs> right? Can you imagine how this is actually happening? Who planned it? Allah planned it. Only Allah can do stuff like that. That's too big for me and you. Now, we have to have a trained, let's just be, we have to have a trained organization. That means we have to hurry up and train ourselves to stand on that stature to be able to contribute to people. 
One person can't contribute to this whole thing. Have to have an organized group of people that are disciplined, organized. Remember when we used to have them demonstrations all the time? The only people remembered was uh, the men in black, remember? Because they tell me, man, they taking advantage of us. You know what I mean? Now we'd be taking care of the stage. We would be running the show. All the other guys, they gonna get up there, mighty brain them, they gonna talk that talk and turn flips, no problem. We would get up there for two or three minutes and everybody, the only people they would remember is us. Those demonstrations when we on the stage, remember people would be handing their babies up to take pictures, right? All of that stuff, that was us. That's what we was doing. It was only a handful of us. But the visual discipline, organization, and that clown saying, I, not clown, because we, right? Email Musa steals money. You remember the demonstration down there? Half a million people down there. Tell the truth. How much of those money was in those baskets of buckets? And where did the white folks put them? They set them right by the stage and walked off. And I made a joke. I said, y'all keep on doing that you, around the Negro. We took that money. Nobody, nobody knows how much it was. And put it in the nurse. The, 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 what was that? You was right there. Yeah. Big. We could have pulled a van, go get a van, bro. And load up. If they had 21 of those things, we could have just gave them five. And moved to Jamaica or the island somewhere because it was enough money in those boxes, bags, everything. So we was never about none of that. Whatever people say is about money, niggas stealing money, niggas. It's not true. It's not even close to true. It, ha it has nothing to do with, and even money. On our school, where they think all the salaries come from? The salaries. And then heating, you know, imagine this place, the big machines out there pumping out. The kids have to be warm. They don't want to sit up here in no cold building. So that thing kick off from seven... Eight o'clock all the way to the kids didn't want to go home, so six o'clock or something like that, in the dead of winter, just whoo, puff it in there. I'm just trying to say, look, uh, if we take advantage of the, the period we're living in, actually, I want to work with the Negroes because we know where we're coming from. You know, we say, hey, man. Uh, can you s straighten up and fly right? Sure, well, let's go. Why not? Why not? Because at least certain things, we know them and they know us. And we done read this Quran over and over. And what's happening now is Quran on steroids. Tell the truth. Every, I mean, it's like, because, uh, you know, all this stuff, you read it, and every year, it, what? You know what I mean? Anyway, are there any questions or any comments? Uh, we decided not to have the... Uh, We'll let you know when we're going to have uh, some. We might do uh, Tarawee two nights just before uh, what's the name, Eid or something. <laughs> With 80 something thousand people dying. Hey, man. No, indeed. So sorry. We're going to have Eid. We plan to have three Eids. And, and what we'll do is. Maybe that evening or uh, something we'll uh, have, uh, we'll get on here and we'll, we'll, we'll do it on the line, not do the eat online.
but we'll tell you too many people came, so we want you to come tomorrow. And y'all ain't working no way, so, right? Yeah, but this place is big enough, 30 people would be fine in here, I believe. So we do 30 at a time. And shoot, they have several jumas over there. We can do a few eight. We can do what we this bid stuff like that. But anyway, we could do several. It's a special case, you know. So we might have three each a day, three. <laughs> I don't know. We don't. We can do. A law knows what our condition is, so we're going to try to do it the best way where it's safer for uh, for the people. In fact, shoot, they do have they have three or four eats every time. What am I talking about? They know. Well, if it's bitter, they started it. Yeah. So, are there any questions? Any comments? Remember. Feel free to call. You see the number on there. We want to get started. Yeah. The other African American imams. Uh, the only message we could think of is. Uh, we're here on this earth, and we're going to get one go round here. And uh, Allah gave us speech. What are we going to talk about? Allah gave us some power and ability. What are we going to do with it? You know, and all the Muslims, what I like to say is that was a time when if you said it was, you were a Muslim, it stood for something. It don't stand for nothing now. Muslim go by, don't nobody even look around. It don't stand for nothing. Oh, you a Muslim? Good. Or bad or nothing. Right? It don't count. That's not... Uh, uh, we will have a message for the other imams coming up soon so we can practice, uh, not Edward Bernaysism, but uh, public relations, right? Remember, this is a period of love and, and friendship. We're just gonna do our part. We can't do any more than what we're doing. Well, not to say we can't. We're gonna do the best we can with what we got. And I think that this time, it's good to bring the people together with a plan and to put that plan in motion. Because individually, technically, I'm already doing what I can. Do we dealing with the white man? And he's responding. He's responding big time. He ain't paying no more attention to nobody else than he is here. This is the way I feel about it. And Sean Hannity is sitting up there, and he's, he's what's the name's uh, advisor? And ain't nobody never called him stupid on TV but me, a dummy. I was well, a dummy, same thing. Told him he's a dummy. If you follow a dummy, then you're a dummy. George Bush is a dummy, and you follow, you like George? Yeah, like, well, you're a dummy. And he's a dummy. And now he's. He is advising a crackpot, a real crackpot. You don't get, this is a wonderful time we live in. How many people can say they have personally seen and been around a real live crackpot? You know? So, thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Okay.